Good morning, everybody, and thank you uh, for the opportunity to showcase some of this um, uh, ISLAC World, Cancer, uh, World Conference on Lung Cancer's highlights for the first day. Uh, thank you for attending. My name is uh, Dr. Jerushka Naidu, and I'm a thoracic medical oncologist at the Beaumont RCSI Cancer Center in Dublin, Ireland, and an adjunct professor of oncology at Johns Hopkins University. Welcome to this ISLAC World Conference on Lung Cancer 2022. It's great to be back in person. Thank you for making the time to cover the meeting, both in person and virtually. We certainly appreciate and respect the role of the press uh, and how important your role is in communicating about new advances in lung cancer. And we pledge to make this easier uh, or as easy as possible for you to cover this meeting. In this press briefing, we will cover a range of sessions. This includes some high impact um, uh, presentations on, on screening to new data on targeted therapies such as Sotorasib. Like all our press briefings, we will include a patient advocate and we're pleased to welcome uh, Mr. Seamus Carter, who also hails from Ireland. Please hold your questions until the end of the briefing and feel free to type them into the chat box if you're attending virtually and be sure to uh, direct them to the appropriate researcher. Also to say that this, uh, this press briefing will be available um, uh, on demand afterwards uh, and people can log in in real time. A video recording will be uploaded to the YouTube page as well for easy reference later today. So without further ado, I'd like to um, invite our first presenter, uh, Dr. Savage, who will present ISLAC's Early Detection and Screening Committee report on global obstacles to lung cancer screening. She holds a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Belgrade in Serbia and is employed at the Institute for Oncology and Radiology of Serbia. Since 2021, she's been serving as the president of the EACR-affiliated Serbian Association for Cancer Research, and her research focuses on molecular pharmaceuticals Genomics. We're very pleased that she is a co-chair of the Diagnostics Working Group of the Screening and Early Detection Committee for the ISLAC. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, esteemed colleagues and friends, good morning. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone in the room and online on behalf of Professor Rudolf Uber and myself and the whole diagnostics working group of the ISLEX Early Detection and Screening Committee. I had a very good introduction from our chair because I also appreciate and the whole diagnostic working group appreciates the role of the press in this very important pressing matter that is a global matter and that, that is one of the missions of ISLEC uh, in the you know, coming years. What I want to stress, and it cannot be stressed enough, is that lung cancer is the number one cause of cancer-related deaths worldwide. This is the reason that so many experts have gathered here in this beautiful city of Vienna to talk about it, to see treatment options, but also to talk about prevention strategies, early detection and screening, which we are very passionate about. I will leave this slide on. I think it's one of the most important ones, just to appreciate all the people that have been working on in the diagnostics working group. I would like to also stress out how many countries have been involved, how many experts, how many disciplines. So we had surgeons, pulmonologists, radiologists, transla translational scientists. So please, when you, when you uh, see them in the hallway, talk to them. The power of your words is sometimes much stronger than our scientific ones. You have a wider outreach. We want to get the message out. I will focus on the perspectives as well. So what we want to do is initiate broader discussions concerning this matter. We need more research. We want to provide patient advocates. We want to provide the press, the patients, every one in the research community with enough evidence-based data to provide some kind of guidelines for countries that intend to introduce screening programs, who should be screened, how, and what to do with the patients which have some kind of positive nodules. How do we do the follow-ups? How do we engage the government and everyone involved to make the process as most efficient as possible? So we know it will be difficult. You can see as a preview, this presentation was very difficult to get up there. So you can see how the, the screening programs will have a problem by being implemented. But I think uh, as we did here, we are not going to give up. We are going to work on this matter. It will not happen today, but in five or 10 years, uh, hopefully in many countries of the world, it will be implemented. We need to reduce the mortality rates of lung cancer. 
we need to get the word out there that it is the number one killer among cancers, although I think we are not talking about it enough. Stress out again, young female individuals, think about their lives, think about the people who could contribute to the society in financial and other ways. Think about populations at high risks who are not only involved in, in uh, smoking, air pollution was mentioned as well. So uh, let's continue to work on the matter. Also, one minute to appreciate all the personnel that has been involved in this work with us. So the whole ISLAC board and staff, I'd like to point out that Casey Connolly and Dr. Wines have been very patient with us. We are a large group of individual experts. Sometimes we can be very open-minded and demanding, but they have been very helpful to produce this data and for any many other projects that we are working on. Also our chair, the chair of the whole committee, Dr. Stephen Lang, one of the most engaged chairs I have ever had the pleasure of working with. And please, for the end, if reach out to us, we can provide you with the QR code and the link for the questionnaire. We would really like to gather as much data as possible, it will have a huge impact in the coming years. And I thank you for your patience. So our next presenter is Dr. Chi Fu Yang who will present both early diagnosis of lung cancer among younger versus older adults, widening disparity in the era of lung cancer screening, and incidence, timing, and survival of second primary lung cancers in patients in the National Lung Screening Trial, the NLST. Great. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share our work with you today. And I'd like to thank the ISLC World Conference on Lung Cancer and the members of the press for their time and also acknowledge the work of our first author, Alexandra Potter, who is here also in the audience. We have no disclosures related to this presentation. With the onset of lung cancer screening in the United States, the number of patients diagnosed with early stage lung cancer is increasing. Many patients with screen detected lung cancers achieve excellent long-term survival, raising the importance of examining the risk of developing second primary lung cancer in this population. The risks of second primary lung cancer among lung cancer survivors has been shown to be four to six fold greater compared to the risk of lung cancer in the general population after adjusting for age, sex, race, and calendar year. The objective of the study was to examine the incidence, timing, and survival of second primary lung cancers using data from the National Lung Screening Trial. We queried data from the National Lung Screening Trial which is a large scale randomized trial that compared the effectiveness of low dose computed tomography versus chest X-ray in reducing lung cancer mortality. The NLST enrolled 53,454 high risk individuals aged 55 to 74 who currently smoked or quit smoking within the past 15 years. For the present study, we included patients diagnosed with clinical stage one to three initial primary lung cancer in the national lung screening trial. Second primaries were categorized as either synchronous or metachronous. Synchronous primary lung cancers were defined as second primary lung cancers that were diagnosed within six months of the first primary lung cancer. Metachronous primary lung cancers were defined as second primary lung cancers that were diagnosed more than six months after the diagnosis date of the first primary lung cancer. We examined the incidence and timing of second primary lung cancer among patients in the study cohort. In addition, overall survival of patients with synchronous and metachronous lung cancers was examined using the Kaplan-Meier method. Of the 1,971 patients diagnosed with lung cancer in the NLST, 1,405 patients were diagnosed with clinical stage one to three initial primary lung cancer. The incidence of second primary lung cancer was 5.8%, of which 55% were synchronous and 45% were metachronous second primaries. This table shows the baseline characteristics of patients in the study cohort diagnosed with synchronous and metachronous primary lung cancers. The median follow-up time of patients diagnosed with synchronous primaries was 29.8 months. The median follow-up time of patients diagnosed with metachronous primaries was 65.9 months. The median time from first to second primary lung cancer was 32 months for patients diagnosed with metachronous second primary lung cancer. There were no significant differences with regard to age 
a diagnosis of the first primary lung cancer, sex, or pack year smoking history between patients diagnosed with synchronous and metachronous second primary lung cancers. These pie charts show the smoking status of individuals diagnosed with synchronous and metachronous second primary lung cancers. 71% of patients diagnosed with synchronous primaries and 68% of patients diagnosed with metachronous second primaries currently smoked at the time of randomization. These graphs show the types of treatments received for initial primary lung cancers among individuals who had a synchronous or metachronous second primary lung cancer. Most patients who developed a synchronous or metachronous lung cancer in the study cohort underwent surgery for their initial primary lung cancer. Of patients diagnosed with synchronous primary lung cancers who underwent surgery for their initial lung cancer, 62% underwent lobectomy, 29% underwent wedge resection. Of patients diagnosed with metachronous primary lung cancers who underwent surgery for their initial lung cancer, 79% underwent lobectomy, 12% underwent segmentectomy, and 6% underwent wedge resection. Next, we assessed changes in the incidence of metachronous primary lung cancer from the date of initial primary lung cancer diagnosis. Among patients with stage one lung, uh, lung cancer, the incidence, of rate, the incidence rate of metachronous primary lung cancer increased with increasing time from the date of first primary lung cancer. Similar trends were observed among patients diagnosed with stage two to three second primary lung cancer. However, no second primaries were diagnosed more than five years after the date of first primary lung cancer diagnosis among patients with stage two to three first primary lung cancer. These pie charts show the stage distribution of the initial primary lung cancer among individuals diagnosed with synchronous and metachronous second primary lung cancers. Among patients who developed synchronous second primary lung cancers, 65% had stage one initial primary lung cancer. Among patients who developed metachronous second primary lung cancers, 81% had stage one initial primary lung cancer. This diagram shows the stage distribution of second primary lung cancers diagnosed among patients who had stage one initial primary lung cancer. Among patients with stage one initial primary lung cancer who developed a second primary, the stage distribution of second primaries was 83% for stage one, 7% for stage two, 5% for stage three, and 5% for stage four. Among patients with stage two initial primary lung cancer who developed a second primary, the stage distribution of second primaries was 43% for stage one, 29% for stage two, and 28% for stage three. And among patients with stage three initial primary lung cancer who developed a second primary, the stage distribution of second primaries was 73% for stage one, 20% for stage two, and 7% for stage three. We also examined the stage distribution of second primary lung cancer stratified by the number of months after the date of initial primary lung cancer diagnosis. Over 80% of second primary lung cancers that were diagnosed within the first two years of initial lung cancer were stage one. Second primary lung cancers diagnosed more than four years after the date of initial primary lung cancer diagnosis were more likely to be identified at later stages. This diagram shows the distribution of the histologic subtypes of second primary lung cancers among patients diagnosed with initial primary lung cancer that was adenocarcinoma histology. Among patients diagnosed with adenocarcinoma initial primary lung cancer who developed a second primary lung cancer, 67% of second primaries were adenocarcinoma, 13% were squamous cell, 10% were lipidic adenocarcinoma, and 10% were other histologic subtypes. Among patients diagnosed with squamous cell initial primary lung cancer who developed a second primary lung cancer, 23% of second primaries were adenocarcinoma, 36% were squamous cell, 9% were lipidic, 14% were small cell, and 18% were other histologic subtypes. This figure shows the overall survival of patients diagnosed with stage one synchronous or metachronous lung cancer during the study period. In this figure, the x-axis is the time in months from the date of initial primary lung cancer diagnosis to death from any cause. Five-year overall survival was 55% for patients diagnosed with synchronous primary lung cancers and 90% for patients diagnosed with metachronous primary lung cancers. 10-year overall survival was 39.5% for patients diagnosed with synchronous primary lung cancers 
and 30.8% for patients diagnosed with metachronous primary lung cancers. We then examined overall survival from the date of second primary lung cancer diagnosis. Notably, overall survival from the date of second primary lung cancer diagnosis was similar for patients diagnosed with synchronous and metachronous second primary lung cancers. For patients diagnosed with synchronous second primary lung cancers, survival is similar to that presented in the previous slide. For patients diagnosed with metachronous second primary lung cancers, five-year overall survival was 51.8% and 10% and 10-year overall survival was 22%. We also evaluated the causes of death among patients diagnosed with stage one initial primary lung cancer who developed a synchronous or metachronous second primary lung cancer. The large majority of patients who developed synchronous or metachronous second primary lung cancers died from lung cancer. There are several limitations to this study. First, the findings may not reflect the risk of second primary lung cancer in populations outside of the NLST eligibility criteria. Second, over 90% of participants in the NLST are white, and these findings may not be generalizable to patients of different racial groups. In addition, the NLST does not include detailed molecular data for patients diagnosed with two primaries of the same histologic subtype. Lastly, the NLST does not include complete data on the mode of treatment of second primary lung cancers. In conclusion, among patients diagnosed with lung cancer in the NLST, 6% of patients developed a second primary lung cancer, which is a rate of 1% to 2% per patient year. The median time to diagnosis of metachronous primary lung cancers was 2.7 years. 27% of second primaries were diagnosed greater than four years after the date of first primary lung cancer diagnosis, illustrating the importance of lifelong follow-up. Five and 10-year overall survival from the date of initial primary lung cancer diagnosis of patients with synchronous primary cancer was 55.2% and 39.5% respectively. Five and 10 year overall survival from the date of initial primary lung cancer diagnosis of patients with metachronous primary cancer was 90% and 38.8% respectively. Thank you. This one. All right, well, thank you for the opportunity to present our second study here. This is on the early diagnosis of lung cancer among younger versus older adults. We have no disclosures related to this presentation. Over the last decade, studies have shown that there have been significant improvements in the early diagnosis and survival of older U.S. adults diagnosed with lung cancer. However, these studies have not evaluated trends in early diagnosis and survival among young adults diagnosed with lung cancer. Previous studies have shown that young adults diagnosed with lung cancer have distinct tumor characteristics and survival compared to older adults diagnosed with lung cancer. It's unknown whether recent improvements in early diagnosis and survival among older adults diagnosed with lung cancer are also observed among young adults diagnosed with lung cancer. The objective of the study was to examine changes in the stage of lung cancer diagnosed and survival of younger and older patients diagnosed with lung cancer in the United States since the introduction of lung cancer screening. We hypothesized that over the last decade, improvements in early diagnosis and survival of older adults diagnosed with lung cancer do not extend to young adults diagnosed with lung cancer. We queried data from the United States Cancer Statistics Database to assess the incidence of non-small cell lung cancer by age group. In addition, we queried data from the National Cancer Database to evaluate changes in the stage of lung cancer diagnosed and survival of patients by age group. We included patients aged 20 to 79 diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer in the United States from 2010 to 2018. We examined changes in the stage of lung cancer diagnosed from 2010 to 2018 for different age groups using multivariable ordinal logistic regression. In addition, we assessed five-year overall survival for different age groups. We also evaluated changes in median overall survival from 2010 to 2018 for different age groups. This graph shows the number of patients diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer in the United States by age group from 2010 to 2018. 
Of note, for the age group of 20 to 29 years old, there were 1,328 patients with lung cancer. For the age group of 30 to 39, there were 5,682 patients with lung cancer. And for the age group of 40 to 49, there were 39,323 patients with lung cancer. This figure shows the breakdown of tumors by histologic subtype for each age group. Carcinoid histology comprised a significantly larger proportion of lung cancers among younger age groups, with 58% and 29% of patients aged 20 to 29, 30 to 39 diagnosed with carcinoid tumors compared to 4% of 70 to 79 year olds. Adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma comprise the majority of other lung cancers diagnosed in each age group. Only a small percentage of lung cancers were large cell carcinoma and adenosquamous cell carcinoma in each group. In subsequent analyses, we focused on adenocarcinoma, squamous cell, large cell, and adenosquamous cell carcinoma. This graph shows the distribution of race by age group among patients in our study cohort. Younger patients were more likely to be Black or Asian when compared to older patients diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer. This graph shows the percentage of patients in the study cohort diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer who are female. About 50% of patients in each age group were female. We then examined the percentage of patients diagnosed with stage one and four non-small cell lung cancer by age group. The blue bars indicate patients diagnosed with stage one. The orange bar indicates patients diagnosed with stage four. Almost 80% of patients aged 20 to 29 were diagnosed with stage four disease, compared to 40% of patients aged 70 to 79. Similarly, only 8% of patients aged 20 to 29 were diagnosed with stage one disease, compared to 29% of pa patients aged 70 to 79. With increasing age, the percentage of patients diagnosed with stage four disease decreased, and the percentage of patients diagnosed with stage one increased. Interestingly, when we examined patients aged 80 to 89 who are ineligible for screening, this trend was no longer observed with an increased rate of stage four disease and decreased rate of stage one disease in this age group. Next, we evaluated whether the percentage of individuals diagnosed with stage four lung cancer changed from 2010 versus 2018 in each age group. In this graph, the blue and orange bars represent the percentage of patients diagnosed with stage four disease in 2010 and 2018, respectively. The percentage of patients aged 20 to 29 and 30 to 39 diagnosed with stage four disease did not significantly change from 2010 versus 2018. The percentage of patients aged 40 to 49 diagnosed with stage four disease was higher in 2018 versus 2010. And in contrast, among patients in age groups over age 50, there was a significant shift to earlier stages of disease identified in 2018 versus 2010. This figure shows the percentage of patients diagnosed with stage four lung cancer from 2010 to 2018 in a younger cohort from 20 to 49 years of age and an older cohort from 50 to 79 years of age. We examined year over year changes in these percentages among patients aged 20 to 49, the percentage of lung cancers diagnosed at stage four increased from 60 to 64% from 20 to 20, 2010 to 2018. In contrast, among individuals aged 50 to 79, the percentage of lung cancers diagnosed at stage four did not change significantly from 2010 to 2013, but then decreased by 3% from 2013 to 2018. The difference in the rate of stage four disease identified between the younger and older cohorts increased from 13% in 2010 to 21% in 2018. We also performed a multivariable adjusted analysis of changes in the likelihood of being diagnosed with earlier stages of disease from 2010 to 2018. The odds ratios presented in this graph represent the year-over-year -year change in odds of being diagnosed with earlier stages of disease. Odds ratios greater than one indicate a shift toward earlier stages of disease identified from 2010 to 2018. Odds ratios less than one indicate a shift toward later stages of disease identified from 2010 to 2018. Among patients aged 20 to 29, 30 to 39, and 40 to 49, 
the multivariable adjusted odds of being diagnosed with earlier stages of disease from 2010 to 2018 did not significantly change. In contrast, patients in age groups of over age 50 had a significantly greater odds of being diagnosed with earlier stages of disease in more recent years. This graph shows the five-year overall survival of patients diagnosed with stage one to stage four by age group. Patients aged 20 to 29 diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer had the lowest five-year overall survival rate at 20%. Overall survival was also low at less than 30% among all other age groups evaluated. This is a similar graph looking at five-year overall survival by age group and clinical stage group. In general, five-year overall survival was higher among younger patients compared to older patients across all stages. However, among patients diagnosed with stage four disease, five-year survival was low for all age groups at 11% for patients aged 20 to 29, 15% for patients aged 30 to 39, and 10% for patients aged 40 to 49. Next, we examine changes in median overall survival among patients aged 20 to 49 years old. From 2010 to 2013, median overall survival did not significantly increase. From 2014 to 2017, median all-cause survival did increase by 11 months. We then specifically evaluated changes in median overall survival among patients aged 20 to 49 diagnosed with stage three to four disease. There were similar increases in median overall survival among this subset of patients with late stage disease, which likely drove the improvements in overall survival observed among the overall cohort of young patients. Notably, these improvements in median overall survival appear to align with the NCCN's recommendation for genetic testing for EGFR and ALK mutations in 2012, as well as the, as well as the FDA's approval of immunotherapies in 2015. We performed a similar analysis of patients aged 50 to 79 years. Among patients aged 50 to 79, there was also a significant increase in median overall survival over the last decade. However, this improvement in survival did not appear to be driven by improvements in the survival of patients diagnosed with more advanced disease. There are several limitations to the study. First, we did not have data on whether lung cancer was screen detected. Second, there were no data regarding the receipt of targeted therapies among patients in our cohort. In addition, there are no data regarding tumor biomarkers. Lastly, we did not have data regarding differences in time from initial presentation to lung cancer diagnosis between younger and older patients. In conclusion, in this national analysis of patients diagnosed with lung cancer from 2010 to 2018, we found that over 64% of younger adults diagnosed with lung cancer continued to be identified late in their disease course. Different tumor biology, delays in diagnosis, and the absence of methods to facilitate early detection of lung cancer among young adults likely contribute to the high rate of stage four disease diagnosed in this population. Although there is no improvement in early diagnosis among young adults, median survival of young adults diagnosed with lung cancer increased by 14 months during the study period largely due to improvements in survival for patients with advanced disease. However, five-year survival of younger patients with stage four disease was still only 10 to 15%. These improvements in median survival observed among young adults diagnosed with lung cancer are encouraging. However, the lack of progress with regard to increasing early diagnosis among this population illustrates the need for strategies to in increase the early detection of lung cancer among younger patients. Thank you. Thank you for those excellent presentations. We'll move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Marta Casarubios, who will talk to us about tumor bulk RNA-seq, identifies patients at high risk of progression in non-complete pathologic responders from the Nadim study. Uh, Dr. Casarubios uh, comes to us from o Oncologia Medica, in Madrid and Spain. She is a passionate scientist with extensive experience in immuno-oncology research. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for the nice presentation and thank you all for this opportunity to show our results. I'm here on behalf of the uh, Spanish Lung Cancer Group. So I'm going to present just a briefing of uh, 
well, some highlights or of our study uh, in uh, uh, patients from the NADIM clinical trial. These are my disclosures. Uh, well, as you may know, non-small cell lung cancer patients with locally advanced disease had lower overall survival. So in this context, our group initiated some years ago the NADIM clinical trial in which patients with resectable stage 3A were treated with uh, three cycles of anti-PD-1 nivolumab and uh, plus uh, chemotherapy prior to surgery. So these results were published in, two, in 2020 in Lancet Oncology, and we have shown that patients treated with this neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy scheme achieve a progression-free survival and overall survival rates at two years of almost uh, 77% and 90% respectively. And also uh, 60, up to 63% uh, of patients achieve a complete pathological response that is no evidence of tumor at the time of the surgery. But also these are encouraging results. Patients with non-complete pathological response, non-severe patients, uh, had a higher risk of disease progression compared to com a complete pathological response. So there is a need to identify gene expression patterns that may affect the long-term outcomes in this high risk group. So here, our study is focusing on post-treatment tumor samples of nadir clinical trial patients. The samples of this nadir clinical trial patients were also categorized as CPR and non-CPR. CPR if they have no viable cells in the tumor specimen, and non-CPR tumors that have a, any number of viable tumor cells in the tumor specimen. So uh, first, we wanted to characterize the differential immune landscape between the uh, two groups, the CPR and non-CPR tumors, as well as to identify gene expression patterns that may affect the long-term outcomes of patients with non-CPR tumors. And com uh, by comparing tumors of patients that has disease progression and no disease progression. So for this purpose, we perform a RNA sequ sequencing analysis of 395 immune-related genes. And we analyze the differential expression genes uh, between groups, between the two groups, the CPR and non-CPR groups, and the group, uh, the groups disease progression and non-disease progression. Also, the differentially expressed molecular pathways and the uh, differential immune cell uh, population estimation in these in these tumor samples. So first, briefly, and regarding the differential immune landscape between CPR and non-CPR tumors, we saw that up to 22 genes were upregulated in the non-CPR group. Most of them were related to proliferation, tumor markers, among others. Uh, and the further GSEA uh, analysis showed an upregulation of pathways that were related to antigen processing, TCR co-expression, and also a uh, lymphocyte infiltrate. On the contrary, patients with non-CPR with non-CPR tumors show an upregulation of proliferation, tumor markers, and tumor antigens that it was consistent with the presence of viable cells in the tumor resection specimens. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in the identification of patients at higher risk of relapse and the comparison between the progressive and non-progressive patients. Uh, well, patients with these non-CPR tumors were further categorized as progressors and, or not progressors, depending on, they, on whether they have disease progression or not. So uh, we wanted to identify some, um, well, uh, we, identify, uh, we wanted to identify an immune expression pattern that can help us to identify patients at high risk of relapse after surgery. So in this concern, we have shown that up to 10 genes were identified and differentially, up, uh, differentially up regulated in, in patients with uh, disease progression. Some were identified, well, some were involved in the inter type 1 interferon signaling and interferon two, uh, type 2 signaling. Uh, but uh, there were no differential expressed pathways or immune cell subtypes um, observed when comparing these two groups. Uh, we also perform a survival analysis in, the, in these uh, patients with non-CPR tumors that pro progress and not, uh, not progress 
after the therapy. And we showed that there is a relationship between higher levels of AKT1 in post-treatment tumor samples of patients uh, that is, uh, was correlated with higher risk of progression and death. And also uh, no difference were observed between progressor and non-progressive patients in estimated cell proportion, higher proportion of neutrophiles uh, in patients with non-CPR were associated with lower uh, PFS and OS or so uh, worse outcomes. So to conclude, our results reinforce the differences between CPR and non-CPR response and support that neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy enables some proficient anti-tumoral immune response. Also, we have identified an immune expression signature in surgical specimens that were associated to disease progression in patients with um, non-CPR tumors with good help in the follow-up and therapeutic management of this high-risk group. And these are the, all the people that contributed to this work. And well, the, the talk is today at um, mid, midday, I think, and in the HAL C7. So hope you to see there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Casarubios. Our next presenter is going to join us virtually, Dr. Yilong Wu from Guangdong Provincial People's Hospital in China. Dr. Wu will present sugamalumab versus placebo after concurrent chemoradiation or sequential chemoradiation in patients with unresectable stage three non-small cell lung cancer, the final PFS analysis of a phase three study. Dr. Wu is a tenured professor um, and past president of the Chinese Society of Clinical Oncology, president of the Chinese Thoracic Oncology Group, and was a member of the board of directors of the ISLAC from 2013 to 2017. Thank you, Dr. Wu. I thank you. Can you see my slide? Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm the honor to attend uh, this uh, press uh, conference today to share the preplan the finally progressively survival analysis of the gene stunt study. This is my uh, disclosure. Concurrent chemotherapy followed by the immunotherapy is the standard of care for patients with the uh, unresectable stage three non cell lung cancer. But the, from this uh, graph here, you see almost the less than 50% of the patient did, could not tolerate it with the concurrent chemotherapy. They are only received the sequenced the chemotherapy. So such as the US, the real world that showed only the 45% of the patient received the concurrent chemotherapy. In the Euro, 35, in the Belgium, 55, in the Netherlands, and uh, 45 in the United Kingdom. Sequence the chemotherapy is the common the utilities. For our knowledge, no clinical trial has shown that an anti pd one pd one antibody as the consolidation treatment can approve survival outcome from following the sequential chemotherapy. James Stone 301 is the first phase three trial to evaluate the anti pdl one drug efficacy and safety in patients who receive the either concurrent chemotherapy or the sequent chemotherapy without the digital progress. The last year, we have, pre, we have pub released the pre plan the PF data and the data show the heart ratio, G64, was observed in the median uh, progress of free survival in the sugar molecule and the 5.8 month in the placebo. In June 2022, sugar molecule was approved for the treatment of the patient with the unresectable state three non cell lung cancer whose disease was not progression following the concurrent or the sequential platin-based chemotherapy in China. Sugamolimab is the first antibody, PDL1, PDL1 monoclonal antibody approved for the stage three in the non-cell lung cancer 
following concurrent or the sequence of chemotherapy therapy. It is also the only pd one monotherapy antibody approved for the both stage three and stage four of the non cell lung cancer. Let's move to the study design of the gene don 301 In this study, the patient with the unresectable stage three non cell lung cancer first digital in progression of the prior concurrent or the sequential chemoradiotherapy were enrolled. The equal PFS should be zero or one in the patient with the non-sensitized EGR of all the loss one alternation should be excluded. All the E0 patients with the randomizer in two to one ratio to either the millimeter or possible group. The stratification factor is the prior chemoradiotherapy type, equal PFS, and total dose of radiotherapy. The prime endpoint is to find the independent central review assessed progress of free survival. The second endpoint includes the over survival, investigate assess the progress of free survival, overall response rate, duration of the response, safety, and so on. Final progress of free survival analysis was planned when the approximate 262 the PFS event occurred. Interline and the final open survival analysis were planned when the approximate 175 and the 2,000 city open survival event occurred respectively. We also do the sum the subgroup analysis. This is the graph show you the final progress of free survival analysis. And the detail, please uh, welcome to my presentation at the later today for more detail. With the longer follow up, the progress of free survival improvement the sub 10. The update, the progress of free survival hard ratio was 0 0.65 with the median progress of free survival of the 10.5 months versus the 6.2 months, respectively. The curve separate from the month floor and the separation was maintained at the wall. The 24 months the progress of free survival rate with the 39% versus the 23% and the 36 month progress of free survival rate where the 26% versus the zero. In concurrent chemotherapy subgroup, median follow-up time was 22.4 months versus the 20 months respectively. A straight heart ratio of the 0 0.7 was observed with the median progress of each level of the eight month in the subgroup group and the four month in the possible group. The progress of free survival benefit were observed by the sugar millimet group regardless of the whether patient had received the prior concurrent chemotherapy or the sequence of chemotherapy. About the uh, over survival, we to find the pre planned internal analysis of over survival had not been reached no the formal test was performed. The over survival analysis continued showing a trend toward improving in the sugar molimate group compared with the placebo group based on preliminary data. The straight heart ratio was 0.69. The separate in over survival curve was maintained throughout the follow up with the 36 month over survival rate of the 56% versus the 30% respectively. With the longer follow-up, increased patients in the placebo group are expected to receive the subsequent anti-cancer immunotherapy, which with a continued effect result of the over survival. We are further investigated the progress of this level and over survival data in the chemoradius of the type of subgroup. The progress of free survival and over survival benefit 
read a zibu that regard is of the weather patient had the reset the concurrent of the sequence of cumulative ZP. From the shift the perceptive grade three to five treatment emerging uh, every advanced the event that occurs in the 61% patient in the sugar molecule group and in 29% patient in the placebo group. Based the the treatment emerging adverse event when report in 4.7% of the patient in the sugar molecule group and 2.4% in the placebo group. In this study, hyperthyroidism is the most common treatment related uh, EA in the sugar group occurs in about 18% of the patient. Most of the treatment related adverse event regret one or two. In conclusion, the results of a gemstone 301 study suggests that, that the sugar lamblet could be safety and effectively used of the component of the sequential chemotherapy therapy and became a standard of the care in this setting for stage three inoperable non non-sumosoran cancer. Finally, I present to all the patients who participated in this study and the support from their family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next presenter is Dr. Kun Denise, who will present a comparison of stage and histology specific CT sensitivity in the Nelson trial and the NLST. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to present here on this new analysis of data from the Nelson trial, um, for whom I should, of course, thank my colleagues and as well anyone who worked on the Nelson trial to make this analysis possible. Uh, I'll be presenting a comparison of uh, CT sensitivity, that is the detectability of lung cancer, um, in the Nelson trial compared to a previous analysis we did of the CT sensitivity in the NLST. Uh, I don't have any relevant financial disclosures, but we owe a debt, of course, to Son and who uh, granted uh, the Nelson study. Um, there have been two major trials of CT screening for lung cancer that were powered to demonstrate a mortality reduction uh, specific to lung cancer. There have been others, of course, but these were large enough to demonstrate this difference. Uh, both trials employed CT screening, uh, but they also had uh, particular differences. Namely, of course, the NLST was larger. It was in a US population. The Nelson trial was in a Dutch Belgian population. And then the NLST had three annual screens, whereas the Nelson trial had screens increasing in interval. One year, one and a half years, two years, two and a half years for a total of four screens. Also, the study population differed slightly. There were different smoking eligibility requirements, as well as a different proportion of males and females between the two trials. And lastly, which we consider a key difference as well, is that they differed in the management of pulmonary nodules as found on the CT screen. Nelson employed a volumetric nodule management follow-up protocol to refer people to a follow-up screen, whereas the NLST looked at the diameter of the nodule in deciding a follow-up procedure. And this decision between which type of protocol to use is still an active discussion. If we look at the lung rights guidelines in the US, these are still largely diameter-based, Whereas the British Thoracic Society and many early implementation studies in uh, the European setting recommend a volume-based Nelson-like protocol. Um, we also see differences in outcomes between the two studies. The NLST demonstrated a 20% mortality reduction uh, in lung cancer specific mortality, whereas the Nelson trial demonstrated a 24% lung cancer mortality reduction among the male participants. And although not statistically significant, but uh, mortality reduction was e even larger among women. Additionally, um, the state shift in the NLST was already very good where we saw um, screen detected lung cancers largely around stage 1A, 1B, but there were also still quite a few 3B, 4 cancers. In the Nelson trial, this was further improved where we saw over 70% stage 1A, 
1B cancers with a lower proportion 3B to 4 cancers. So taking into account the differences in the trial setup, the trial population, as well as the nodule management protocol, and looking at these differences in outcomes, we were interested to know how can we assign this difference in outcome to each of these differences in the trial setup, um, which pertains to this research question, to which extent are the more favorable state shift and larger efficacy of the Nelson trial attributable to, attributable to potential differences in CT sensitivity? It could be that it's the number of screens, it could be that it's the screening interval, or it could be that we were better able to detect the lung cancers uh, using a volume-based nodule man management protocol. To make this assessment, we use a microsimulation model, which is the MISCAN lung model. It's uh, been used for other studies before we have done some cost effectiveness analyses with it, and it has also informed the 2014 and 2021 USPSTF guidelines for screening eligibility. Um, the model works on a participant level. We look at the characteristics of the participant, their smoking uh, history, their age um, at the time of entering tr the trial, their gender, and we make individual level predictions of do we suspect that this person is likely to have a lung cancer at the moment of their screen? And if they have a lung cancer, we think it may be in stage 1A, 1B, further on. We make many repeated estimates to get an aggregate uh, indication of what we suspect the number of detectable cancers is at each screening event. And we have done this before th for the NLST. What we then do is we compare what we expect the number of detectable cancers should be to what we actually detect. And this gives us an estimate of the sensitivity <clears throat> not just for the CT sensitivity, for the CT scan as a whole, but by stage and histology as well. If we see, uh, if we expect lots of 1A cancers to be prevalent, but we only detect a few, that suggests a uh, uh, small sensitivity. Rather, if the estimate, if the detected cancers is very close to our estimate, it suggests a very high sensitivity. And we can do this also using the histology distribution that we know from incidence data to get it specific to the histology of the cancer. And we can also, um, in the simulation, make sure that the timing of the screens for each participant, which are then aggregated to a trial level, is particular to the trial. So for our analysis of the NLST data, we simulated three annual screens. For our analysis of the Nelson data, we do screens at the interval particular to Nelson, and we also, of course, do four screens to represent the Nelson trial. And this allows us to control for all those characteristics that were mentioned before, different trials set up, as well as the individual uh, participant characteristics. Uh, what we then find is the following. In the light blue, you see our estimates that we had before from the NLSC. In the dark blue, you see our Nelson estimates. And the y-axis is the estimated CT sensitivity by stage, as well as by the two primary histologies of adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And we find that Particularly for stage 1A adenocarcinoma, the sensitivity was already quite good. We are generally able to detect the adenocarcinomas quite well, but it's further improved from 57% up to 73%. For squamous, there's also some improvement for uh, stage 1A. Uh, we did not find a difference for stage 1B, but we see stage 2, a very large improvement in our rate of detectability. And this extends also to the larger stages, but of course, for screening, we're interested mostly in those 1A to 2 uh, lung cancers, can we detect those so that we can achieve a favorable state shift and potentially help someone achieve a better survival outcome? Uh, so what I would like to leave you with today is this. If we perform microsimulation modeling, we find a higher sensitivity uh, in the Nelson trial for early stage adenocarcinoma, particularly as well as stage two squamous cell carcinoma with sensitivities as high as 73% for detecting a stage 1A adenocarcinoma. And we find that this is able to explain the state shift and efficacy of the Nelson trial. We did not find the uh, timing of the screens, nor the number of the screens, nor the study population in itself to be able to explain the difference we saw in the state shift in the Nelson trial for that we needed new estimates of the CT sensitivity. And this indicates that the volume-based nodule management, which you already know to have a lower follow-up rate, so that, so that it's associated with less unnecessary biopsies and uh, burden of increased follow-up, it may also be associated with higher ability to detect these early stage lung cancers. And therefore we're seeing early stage implementation studies in Europe. The US is all, uh, already recommending screening as well. It may improve the lung cancer mortality reduction in population screening levels. Uh, 
That's it. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Our next presenter is Dr. Yu Chen Chan. Dr. Dr. Han will discuss intertumoral molecular heterogeneity of non-small cell lung cancer with met exon 14 skipping, and this will be um, a virtual presentation. Good morning. I'm Yu Chen Han, a pathologist from Shanghai Chest Hospital and Shanghai Jiao Tong University. I'm very excited to be here today to share the work of intertumoral molecular heterogeneity of non-small cell lung cancer with MET exon 14 skipping. Disclosure. Introduction. MET exon 14 skipping mutation is a rare driver for NSCLCs, which is present about 3% of NSCLCs. NSCLC patients with MET exon 14 skipping are characterized by a higher frequency in polymorphic carcinoma and adenosquamous cell carcinoma than in adenocarcinoma. Recently, the approval of MET-TGIS, Sotinib, Comtinib, and Toptinib for NSCLC is carrying MET exon 14 skipping down a new era for MET-targeted therapy. These drugs displayed encouraging clinical efficiency yield progressive free survival of 5.4 to 12.4 months in clinical trials. However, it has been reported that one third to half of patients saw inherent resistance to mite TKIs, which indicated biological heterogeneity in NSLCs driven by mite exon 14 skipping. This is the flow chart of retyping MET exon 14 skipping. A total of 10,525 previously untreated NSCLCs from 2017, uh, April 2017 to December 2020 at Shanghai Chest Hospital were included in this study. DNA based target NGS and sequencing analysis were performed. And from those, 133 cases were detected with MET exon 14 skipping. Then, all the samples were subjected to target RNA sequencing using panel consisting of 2,660 oncoimmunology genes. Finally, 126 cases were confirmed with MET exon 14 skipping positive. Uh, uh, MET exon 14 skipping. Single sample gene set enrichment analysis and pathway level unsupervised clustering con conducted to identify molecular subtypes in MET exon 14 skipping positive patients. Subtype specific pathways, tumor microenvironment, and the clinical pathological features were further analyzed. Four molecular subtypes, including subtype A, B, C, and D, were established. Subtype A, accounting for 33.3%, were characterized by activation of MET signaling, such as upregulation of PTK2, cell mortality, degradation of extracellular matrix and cell cycle, et cetera. Subtype B, accounting for 15.1%, was a mixed subtype. It was associated with fatty acid metabolism as well as response to oxidative stress. Subtype C, accounting for 14.3%, was characterized as immune activation phenotype. And subtype D, 37.3% displayed bypass activation of oncogenic pathway like notch, MAP, ERP, PS3K, AKT, and intrac signaling pathway. Immune macroenvironment analysis suggested that subtype A was characterized as immune suppressive phenotype with higher infiltration of t rex cells. On the contrary, Subtype C displayed higher infiltration of T cells and tumor-associated macrophage, as well as high level of 
MHC2 signatures. Full correlation between subtypes and the clinical pathological features. Subtype A was significantly associated with more aggressive clinical characteristics. For example, more advanced tumor stage, larger tumor size, and a higher percentage of invasive phenotype morphology, and numerical Salter disease-free survival. 11 patients, including eight cases of subtype A and three cases of subtype D were treated with met GKIs. The survival probability analysis showed that both types uh, these two subtypes have significant differences in the efficiency of MAT TKIs. This study disclosed the clinical relevant intertumoral heterogeneity of NSCLC driven by MAT exon 14 skipping. Based on the molecular subtyping, subtype A was more sensitive to MAT TKIs, while subtype D was putatively resistant to MAT TKIs. Of note, subtype C might be more vulnerable to immunotherapy. Thank you for your attention. Our next presenter is Dr. K. Morikawa, also joining us virtually. And Dr. Morikara will discuss his abstract, a phase two study of lung cancer gene panel testing using cytological specimens. Thank you for your introduction, Dr. Naidu. Um, my name is Kei Morikawa from St. Marian University School of Medicine. I, I will share the presentation. Okay. Okay, let's start. Uh, this is uh, my presentation. I will talk about the prospective validation study of lung cancer gene panel testing using cytological specimen. There's no disclosure. The mouse panel CDX is very important for precision medicine. Currently, tissue biopsy is considered to be a best choice for multi-panel CDX assay because tissue biopsy can get sufficient histological and genetic information. However, in the tissue, tissue biopsy is invasive and sometimes not enough for gene panel testing. Of course, liquid biopsy is an alternative non-invasive approach for panel assay, but the problem is the detection sensitivity decreases. We thought that cytology samples could be a promising backup for multi-CDX panel assay to fill these gaps. Cytology sample correction is generally less invasive compared to tissue biopsy, and diagnosis sometimes could be done by cytology samples alone. Cytology sample correction may have a good balance of less invasiveness and high detection sensitivity. These four cases show the tissue biopsy samples could not be corrected under these situations like plural massive effusion, mucinous subtypes invasion, and bronchial uh, or tracheal stenosis stenosis, stenotic change by the tumor. Uh, it's very hard to take tissue samples because the forceps could not open in the axis bronchus. But these four cases detected driver mutation by cytological specimen. We need highly sensitive NGS assay to apply cytological specimens to panel tests. We consider, the, we consider the application of Rankes Compact Panel, LCCP, invented by Dr. Kato, NAISD in Japan. Uh, the analytical performance of the panel has been validated using 1,600 clinical FFP samples of 
Dr. Higashiyama's institution, OIST, and described in this research paper. The compact panel has been developed based on the research by the Japanese company DNA Chip Research Incorporated. And in the last year, this product was submitted for regulatory approval in Japan as multi CDX panel assay of NSCLC. Compact panel focuses on the lung cancer driver genes, eight druggable genes as listed here, features as compact design, highly sensitive, highly accurate, and high, high success rate uh, compared to the other CDX. We validated clinical utility of the compact panel for cytologic samples. We use some cytological specimens corrected by transbronchial brushing, TBNA needle washing, and plural effusion. The malignant cells were confirmed by Rose procedure or paired sample, which are divided by original container and sequentially evaluated cytologically. Cytological samples were directly stirred to the GM tube, which contains nucleic acid protective agent. No centrifugation or freezing required. So very easy uh, for sample storage and shipping. The turnaround time is very short, especially when using loss procedure. We conducted a single center prospective study from two years ago to collect and analyze cytology samples. The primary endpoint you know, of, this, of this study is success rate of LCCP analysis using cytological specimen. Second endpoint is mutation core profiling using LCCP and concordance with CDX. Nucleus this is extracted from cytological specimen and comparison between LCCP test result using cytological specimen uh, and FAP tissue sample with gene R frequency. In 255 prospectively enrolled cases, 163 cases were cytopathologically confirmed adenocarcinoma and conducted LCCP analysis. This slide shows patient characteristics. Most cases were advanced stage and samples were collected mainly using bronchoscopy. We defined assay success criteria as follows. According to this definition, all samples, all 163 samples were successfully analyzed using LCCP. And LCCP showed a high concordance uh, mutation call to other CDX with 99.5%. Sufficient nucleic acid, acid yield is obtained regardless regardless of the examination method. And the DNA integrity number and RNA integrity number values, which indicate the quality of nucleic acids was very high. This pie chart showed that LCCP detected gene mutations in approximately 17% of patients with adenocarcinoma. This figure shows that the concordance of variant R frequency in cytology and tissue sample was very high. This study has just been accepted in the cancer journal. And so please refer to it and please feel free to contact us uh, about the technical aspect of this procedure. And this research is uh, currently undergoing multi-center trials in Japan, and LCCP might be used for clinical practice as a new CDX kit in our country within this year. Thank you for listening.
our last presentation before questions, and of course, we will go back to the first presentation at the end, is from Dr. Bob Lee, who will join us virtually. Dr. Lee will present Code Break 100-101, a first report of safety and efficacy of sotorasib in combination with pembrolizumab or atezolizumab in advanced KRAS G12C mutant non-small cell lung cancer. Thank you, Dr. Naidu, for the kind introduction. I'm sorry I can't be with you all in beautiful Vienna, but I really I'm grateful for the opportunity to share with you from New York the first report of the safety and efficacy of sotorasib in combination with pembrolizumab or tezolizumab in advanced HERAS G12C non-small cell lung cancers. This is the, uh, uh, the analysis uh, from the CODEBREAK 100-101 clinical trial. These are my disclosures. So as a background, sotorasib is a first-in-class KRAS G12C inhibitor. It has been approved as monotherapy in over 40 countries around the world for patients with previously treated KRAS G12C mutant advanced non-small cell lung cancers. These approvals uh, were based on the international registrational trial of CODEBREAK 100, where the pooled analysis showed an overall response rate of 41% as recently presented at AACR. Uh, with a median duration of response of 12 months and a median overall survival of 12.5 months. And it was uh, uh, largely uh, well tolerated uh, with a uh, low percent, 6% uh, risk of uh, treatment discontinuation. Now, uh, we're trying to improve this uh, and bring a better treatment for patients in the first line setting, which is still remains an unmet need. And the background for this is that sotorasib synergizes with anti-PD-1 uh, inhibitors to uh, suppress and inhibit tumor growth in mice. This is in preclinical studies uh, as uh, published in Nature, as you can see from the figures. And this com combination enhances CD8 T cell infiltration in, in mouse models. And we, ho we are hoping uh, that this combination would then uh, lead to a better regimen for these patients and potentially uh, eventually a first line treatment uh, option for patients. So in this study, we uh, combined sotorasib with the anti-PD-1 pembrolizumab or anti-PD-01 atezolizumab. Because of the historical difficulties combining targeted therapy with immunotherapy, uh, we were very flexible in this dose escalation, dose finding study. Sotorasib doses could be escalated or de-escalated de uh, across a uh, five dose range, uh, five doses. Uh, and also we explored concurrent treatment uh, with the combination of sotorasib with, with uh, pembrolizumab or tezolizumab, as well as a lead in where you could have sotorasib as a monotherapy first for three to six weeks, and then leading up to the combination uh, therapy with pembrolizumab or tezolizumab. And this study, uh, this analysis uh, occurred after a median follow-up time of 12.8 months. We primarily looked at safety, but also looked at secondary endpoints such as overall response rate, duration of response, and disease control rate. We treated a total of 58 patients. And as you can see, 67% of them had prior NTPD-1 or pd one therapy. Uh, and uh, the median prior line of therapy was one, up to seven prior lines of therapy. And the pd one expression levels also detailed uh, below. So we first looked at the uh, combination with pembrolizumab uh, as a concurrent regimen. And we started off with pretty high doses at 720 and 960. And as you can see here, we saw a very high percentage of uh, treatment-related adverse events, primarily hepatotoxicity with elevation of ALT and AST. Those were largely asymptomatic elevations of liver enzymes uh, however, because of this experience, we dosed the escalated with the sotorasib dose down to 360 milligram daily and 120 milligram daily. And we saw in this experience a trend toward a lower incidence of hepatotoxicity with the lower doses. 
we then looked at the lead in uh, versus concurrent experience. And as you can see, whether it's pembrolizumab or tezolizumab cohorts, the lead in regimen had numerically lower risk of grade three and four treatment related adverse events. Here, the grade three to four hepatotoxicity occurred mostly outside of the DLT window, the dose limiting toxicity window of the first three weeks of treatment. And the vast majority uh, of these events resolved with corticosteroids, treatment modification, or discontinuation. And the incidence of hepatotoxicity uh, was similar in immunotherapy naive or immunotherapy pretreated patients. We then looked at the dose of sodoracib within the leading cohorts uh, based on the knowledge we gained during the uh, earlier cohorts. Uh, and we also saw that uh, with the lower doses of sodoracib as leading, we had a lower incidence of hepatotoxicity or grade three or four treatment related adverse events. Of note, at the 240 milligram dose, it was a 20%. Uh, still a 20% incidence of grade three ALT AST elevation, but better than the uh, what we started off with. This is the waterfall plot showing an overall uh, response rate of 29% in all commas. This is a very heterogeneous uh, mixture of different regimens and different combinations and different co uh, cohorts. Uh, and the treatment responses may have been uh, affected because many patients had to discontinue treatment, so they didn't have drug exposure for a long period of time. And the duration uh, of response, as you can see here, uh, was uh, had a median of 17.9 months. And still eight patients uh, were still ongoing uh, to have uh, treatment benefit and response out of those 17. And the responses were also similar uh, between the immunotherapy naive or pretreated patients. Median depth of response was 51% was, uh, shrinkage. This is the sodoracib leading uh, and pembrolizumab cohort experience at low doses, uh, up to 360 milligrams of sodoracib. As you can see, uh, durable. Uh, clinical benefit was observed with deep responses uh, and still to date six uh, patients still had ongoing uh, clinical benefit with four of them receiving concurrent treatment with sodoracid plus pembrolizumab and the other two receiving continuation of sodoracid. This is a case study of a patient of mine who just as an example uh, received concurrent sodoracib with pembrolizumab at full dose. And within the first uh, cycle, she was doing fine. But after the second cycle, the ASTL ALT went up uh, from grade one to grade three. And this necessitated uh, holding the drugs, prednisone administration, uh, until the AST and ALT came down, as you can see on the, on the, in the figure. Uh, and then eventually the pembrolizumab had to be discontinued. So she continued sodoracib at a lower dose of 240 milligrams, which continues to this day. It's been maintained for more than two years with a complete response that is ongoing. The, we were able to do, get a liver biopsy to find out why were there so many uh, hepatotoxicity. In this particular case, we saw a lot of infiltration of immune cells. There were mononucleosides, there were kaffir cells, a lot of liver injury with... Uh, uh, inflammation and infiltration of the immune cells. Uh, whether this is uh, responsible for the long-term response in this patient, we don't know, uh, and more uh, studies need to be done uh, to answer this question. So in conclusion, in a uh, cohort of 58 patients, uh, both pretreated and, and IO naive settings, the sodoracib uh, with a tezolizumab or pembrolizumab combination led to a higher incidence of grade three to four treatment-related adverse events 
compared to the monotherapy experience that, that was already published. Uh, but we did see ways we could mitigate this by lowering the dose of sodoracib and also doing the lead-in uh, regimen experience. And both ways had uh, trended a lower incidence of hepatotoxicity. These were largely asymptomatic liver enzyme elevations that occurred outside of the DLT window and resolved with corticosteroids and treatment modification or discontinuation, so manageable. There were no treatment-related deaths in this uh, study. And the leading cohorts did demonstrate a durable clinical activity uh, and deep responses. And among the 17 responders, the median duration of response was 17.9 months, with almost half of them still responding. So based on this experience, a lower dose of soda acid as leading at 240 milligrams is currently being explored in current combination with pembrolizumab as a potential first-line therapy strategy for patients. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, we'll now open for questions, after which we will uh, have a repeat of our first presentation and then our patient advocacy comments. Any questions from the floor for our speakers? And that was great. You had two great points. And so, what should we do about giving patients with lung cancer? They're not eligible for screening. So, what's the solution there? And how can we get about it? The second point is also, I think, sobering that to go through all this to cure some of these lung cancer patients, yet many are at risk for a second cancer. Question. How do we think about that? How do we follow that? And, and big topics for both. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Great. Thank, thank you very much. The I'll do I'll address the second question first. I, I think that it's going to be important to have continued long-term CT surveillance of patients even after their treatment. And um uh as as we have shown that the second primaries can often occur one, two, three, maybe even four or five years later. Um and then the to address your first question, um that's that's a really important question. I think what we're trying to do with this study is to shine a light on this issue of patients who are younger, who have lung cancer over uh, in this cohort, there are over uh, 40,000 patients who were 49 years and younger who had lung cancer. So my cousin died of lung cancer at 41 years of age, uh, a year and a half ago. So um, I don't have a good answer to your, your question right now, but, but our, our hope is to shine a light on this issue and to really galvanize the lung cancer community and researchers, doctors, patients, everybody to really try to uh, focus on strategies that can better detect these lung cancers. Thank you. And regarding the first, there's a huge presentation tomorrow on subloblar resection versus lobectomy. <laughs> Should we be doing limited resection for screen detected <laughs> cancers? Is that the answer? Are they going to get a second cancer? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I think that um, we'll, we'll see what um, Dr. Artorki's findings show, but uh, I think that certainly Sublobar resection will, um, the JCOG study has already shown that that is an uh, effective strategy for um, a lot of these earliest stage lung cancer. So thank you. Can I step in as a, just as a follow up? Also, we are very passionate about expanding the screening programs to young female individuals who have never smoked in their life. This is also a subpopulation that I would be very happy to see an updated data, you know, in the future because this is the, I'm sure Professor Rudolph would like to also comment on this. This is something we are passionate about in the diagnostics working group. So as a representative of such a group, I, I hope in the future we will be able to expand the programs. Yeah, we published a paper about never smokers and screening. The problem is to find the characteristics which yeah, a person should be screened in younger age, which are not smoking. And therefore, it would be rather important to get a good characteristics of all the younger patients who didn't smoke and nevertheless developed lung cancer. We are now trying to analyze there's some cohorts of non-smokers which got screening. And we are now trying to analyze the characteristics of these patients.
Any other questions from the floor? <laughs> yeah, it's great. And as you know, there's a talk on air pollution coming up in one of the next press sessions for the press. And so pay attention because that might have some implications for these never smoking cancers and maybe certain populations, right? But Marta, I'm also interested. Obviously, everybody is interested in neoadjuvant therapy. It's a real exciting topic for everyone. And your ability to sort of tell who might need more therapy afterwards is important. Are you using the same techniques to find out which patient should get the therapy up front? And is that going to change the paradigm for neoadjuvant versus adjuvant, which is such a such a topic of discussion? We, uh, at the time, we didn't analyze the uh, adjuvant treatment. Well, the uh, in the study in clinical trial, patients were treated first with neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy with nivolumab, and then they are treated with adjuvant uh, immunotherapy with nivolumab, but we didn't uh, check uh, these results now. And we also, uh, what, did, uh, what uh, we did find in, uh, in pretreatment tumor samples of these patients, that they have like a, a immune, uh, their immune system is already um, is already activated before they get the the immunotherapy. So uh, it shows uh, it showed us that uh, it's very important to have these pretreatment pretreatment tissue samples from these patients, so that uh, you can uh, like. Uh, focus the immunotherapy in patients that have this uh, pre preactivated immune system. But we we did not uh, check for the adjuvant immunotherapy, so we don't know the difference. In the interest of time, we might close the uh, question and answer session now, if that's okay. And from here, uh, invite Mr. Cotter's comments. Um, Please excuse me for the podcast, um, uh, but the introductions have been made. Thank you very much for your uh, kind attention and for your attendance in the press conference. Thanks. Every press briefing uh, features a patient advocate. We are fortunate that Seamus Cotter has uh, come to join us today. Um, at each of the following press briefings on Monday and Tuesday, we'll have a uh, patient advocate too. And I'm, I hope that you will stay and listen to his remarks because everything that um, the researchers do ends up trying to benefit patients like Seamus. So Seamus, take it over. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for to the IA, IALC for the opportunity to say a few words. Um, I won't keep you long because I know we've gone way, way over time. Um, one, one of the recurring themes of all the presentations um was lung cancer screening and early detection and some of the 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 main highlights and messages that i took from from this um session was um about the survival of second primary lung cancer patients um as one um the second was the comparison of the ct screening sensitivity um in the nelson trial versus the um the National Lung uh, Cancer Screening Trial. Also, the differences in early diagnosis of lung cancer between um, the young adults and the older adults. Um, and um, as you just heard, the challenges facing the low and middle income countries regarding lung cancer screening. Um, recently, um, on the 1st of August, it was World Lung Cancer Day 22. Um, the group that I'm a member of in Ireland um, uh, unanimously agreed that our social media message for the day would be um, that lung cancer screening finds 80% of lung cancer at an early stage when it is more curable. Without screening, 70% of lung cancers are found at a later stage when there is less chance of a cure. This statement just highlights the importance of screening and all the different um, uh, uh, trials and studies and activities that are happening around that. Um, I suppose notwithstanding the importance of the screening of equal importance to patients, 
um, are the ongoing uh, clinical trials such as those presented here. Um, I think clinical trials can change uh, the standard of care for patients um, and those are always welcomed. And um, I'm glad to see, I think the, the code break um, 100 and 101 trials look like they'll achieve this. Um, for KRAS uh, G12C patients. So I look forward to further developments in the code break trials. And um, just thank you for the opportunity to say a few words. Thank you, Seamus, appreciate that. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions um, among the researchers that are still here. Of course, you can all email us your questions and we're still available on chat for a few more minutes until that uh, the Zoom shuts down. So thank you for attending and uh, look forward to more information about tomorrow's briefing. Thank you.